So you did a podcast with David Sinclair on your channel, right? Before? Yeah, a couple uh, of years ago. Okay, so it was a while ago now. Because I would be curious if anyone's grilled him on the Matt Foreman study that just came out or like, like in general, did you talk to him about his Matt Foreman use? Because I know even before the study, you weren't like gung ho on it to begin with. So like your initial, your initial kind of like perspective of the drug, um, if it has viability in any context would be, you know, just interesting for me to know personal interest. And then above and beyond that, this new data that came out that suggests it's like heavily implicated in the birth defects in males. Males. Yeah. So hypospadias. Yeah. We could put a link or I can screen share. I pulled some stuff up, but yeah. So I wasn't a fan of metformin previously. I'll, and I'll, uh, I'll con- enable I'll con- the screen share. Yeah. Let's see. I'll contextualize this. So metformin is a great example. Like we talked about, yes, here's a molecule somewhat derived from plants. Again, there is a derivative of metformin in French lilacs, okay, um, which is essentially a toxin. Like this is a plant defense chemical. Screen and share the, should be on now. Okay, cool. The that. mechanism, I'll say this and then I'll pull up the study that we were talking about with hypospadias. So the mechanism of metformin is super interesting. So people think that it's a complex one inhibitor, but it doesn't inhibit complex one at physiologic concentrations. It actually does this, it's like really deep biochemistry. I did a podcast with uh, Petra Dobromilski from Hyperlipid talking about this on my show because I got really into biochemistry. So it's glycerophosphate dehydrogenase, which is a part of the, it's a part, it's after glycolysis that regenerates NADH in the early steps of glycolysis. Like that's what metformin appears to inhibit. And that's part of the mechanism. Functionally, what that means is that the good thing about metformin is it shuts down inappropriate gluconeogenesis at the level of the liver in people who are insulin resistant. A lot of people think that diabetes is like you eat too much sugar, your blood sugar goes high. That's not how it works at all. Um, You eat too much sugar and then your body is actually making sugar. Hyperglycemia and diabetes is inappropriate gluconeogenesis by the liver, which is the formation of glucose de novo because the liver is insulin resistant. So insulin, all the studies I've seen suggest insulin is not necessarily anabolic, it's anti-catabolic. So it stops the flow of like free fatty acids. It stops catabolism. So do you think that downstream, a lot of insulogenic cascades that lead to growth factor production are kind of very like pro-proliferative? Like for example, GH downstream, insulin presence is kind of like critical for the IGF-1, for example, and some of these growth factors that are, you know, very, very, I don't know, like satellite cell proliferative, which could then lead to increased myonuclear donation, which you could then hypothetically hypertrophy those donated myonuclei if you were a bodybuilder. So that's where the idea of using like high carbohydrate intakes while staying as lean as possible, ideally and insulin sensitive. And then the implementation of like things to keep you insulin sensitive while you crush a shit ton of carbs while using like exogenous GH with the presence of those carbs drives up IGF levels to like crazy amounts. And you get like the most hyperplasia and hypertrophy possible. So like those kind of cascades, um, like those don't seem to be like, anti-catabolic they seem to be like the most anabolic and like yeah. potentially like cancer driving as well like in that kind of vein do you still see it as like an anti-catabolic hormone or? well i mean i think just if we're talking about insulin action specifically oh, like inherently talking, what it does itself yeah yeah but like downstream yeah there's a lot of potentially anabolic things okay yeah cool but there's good studies that show that it's like anti-catabolic and not necessarily anabolic per se but yeah i mean it certainly is part of these like downstream anabolic cascades, but okay. there's so many interesting things in that, in what you were just saying. But anyway, yeah, this, this idea that, that insulin could be involved and that if the, if the liver becomes insulin resistant and we can talk about what I think is driving insulin resistance, it looks to be broken fat cells and this, this sort of like impaired adipogenesis. Like I think insulin resistance, most people would agree that insulin resistance, AKA metabolic dysfunction is starting in the fat cells. And then we can talk about why you know, like what is causing the fat cells to get broken, but broken fat cells appear to be the root cause of metabolic dysfunction. But one of the downstream effects of that at a level of the liver is, well, the liver isn't responding to insulin and you get this gluconeogenesis going out of control. And that's why you get hyperglycemia in diabetes, et cetera, pre-diabetes. And, but metformin blocks that. And it probably blocks it by glycerophosphate dehydrogenase, which is really fascinating biochemistry and the regeneration of NADH in, in, um, in, uh, glycolysis. But what we know is that 
when you're in medical school, you learn, okay, you can't give metformin to somebody if their creatinine is more than 1.4 because they'll get lactic acidosis. That's not a good thing. And then recently more and more stuff has come out about metformin and B12 deficiency. So what's going on there? It doesn't appear to be related to intrinsic factor, but metformin can lead to B12, which is kind of an important B vitamin if you want to make DNA and neurons and, and not have horrible anemia and like potentially irreversible, you know, neurologic damage. Uh, that's important. So we have to get diabetics B12 and watch their, their B12 with metformin. So it has these bad side effects, right? In some people who, who will not make lifestyle change, metformin is a life-saving drug and the side effects are worth the risks, but this is medicine. And in medicine, we are pretty good at saying, okay, watch out for lactic acidosis, watch out for B12. And we've also known, I think the study what about the, the changes study. in the microbiome as a result of metformin? Do you think that's just like a consequence of what it's doing interaction wise? And that's ultimately what a downstream outcome is, but that's not like a primary reason why it's like effective. It's, it's so hard. I mean, the microbiome is such a black box, man. Yeah. Do you remember that? Like, what was that big lawsuit? Um, where that lady claimed to make this like magic black box and you could put your blood in and it would show. Oh yeah. Stuff. Theranos yeah. or whatever. There, there yeah. Those, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> like dude, the microbiome is the microbiome is such a black box. Sorry. <clears throat> it's such a black box. Um, when people say like, Oh, this changes the microbiome and it's good or bad. I'm like, I have no idea what that means for the microbiome. I can tell like your microbiome changes. Right. Yeah. But is it good? Is it bad? Who knows, dude? And, and there's so many different nodes and connections and niches for niches for different organisms in the microbiome. It's crazy. So I don't think we understand the microbiome well enough to clearly say like, yes, no, like these are good microbiome changes, bad microbiome changes in general. And um, yeah, so that's a tough, tough thing. Um, but I mean, look at this study, if we're talking about testosterone. Um, so this is 2021. February 20, February 3rd. But I mean, this is one small study, 70 individuals, metformin dropping testosterone individuals with newly diagnosed type two diabetes. So that's interesting. Do you Anything hold basic else? attention token? Uh, what is that? <laughs> it's the, yeah, the cryptocurrency that is run through the brave browser. I was just wondering, oh. cause I saw, I saw the symbol on your top right section. Oh no, no, I just oh, okay. have, the, I just have, I'm just using a brave browser. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry about that. I just noticed. <laughs> So, um, so what they did in this study was they normalized uh, their glycemia with insulin for five days. So they say 70 men, they gave them insulin pump therapy for five days to achieve glucose normalization. And then they were randomized to either control, which is insulin only or metformin for one month and testosterone was measured at baseline randomization one month after treatment. And you can see here that when you normalize the testosterone, it, when you normalize the glycemia, testosterone goes up, but then you give them metformin and it like, kind of drops the testosterone significantly in all of the measures with metformin. So the reason it went up is because you normalize the glycemia with insulin. So nobody's done a study where they just give metformin to see what the net effect on the testosterone is, but this is interesting. Is there some sort of a, an endocrine disruptive effect to this molecule? Again, what are the side effects of this molecule? There's definitely a benefit to metformin, but we can't this is the, I think the, the philosophical error that so many people make. We can't just assume that a drug is all good, that a plant molecule is all good, what's going on here. And now we have, this is the science article talking about the study in the annals of internal medicine. Um, I can't get past the paywall to see the study. Yeah, but I, read the, I, I, I tried I read, though, I tried. I know, Sci-Hub failed me. Yeah, uh, same. You know. So you read, you read this article and basically they summarize it. There's significantly increased rates of hypospadias, which is where the urethra goes to the bottom of the penis rather than out the end of the penis in men taking metformin. And they controlled for a lot of different things. It's an observational study. It's not an RCT, but they controlled for a lot of different parts of this saying like, okay, could it have been something else? Could it have been their diabetes? Could have been another drug they're taking? And no, it really looks like metformin is associated, causation is not, correlation is not causation, but it's pretty significant. Now, you know, the, the absolute risk reduction or the absolute risk increase in this is pretty low, um, but metformin is 86 million people prescriptions. So they say here, um, it's only affecting the males who are taking metformin while the sperm was being made. I found online 64 days for full spermatogonia production. They say 90 days before conception. So you can imagine like, 
if somebody took the metformin, not 90 days before conception, it's okay. But if you're making sperm, that's a little bit disrupted because this is some sort of a hormonal disruptor. They're saying significantly increased rod, odds of, um, of genital defects, which is a big deal. This is one and of those then, things I've always w- wondered about as individuals who are using pharmaceuticals and like epigenetic changes you could pass on to, to your children. <clears throat> and if it would be like prudent and almost responsible to be coming off of all pharmaceuticals in like the time frame where you have like full sperm production, maturation, development, and impregnation, and then making sure your wife is, you know, doing the proper things as well. Cause like, even for me, like I use a five alpha reductase inhibitor for hair loss, but I'm aware of the fact that five alpha reductase inhibition in like a pre pubescent child can lead to like a literal like micro penis. I'm not saying that there's any evidence to suggest that it's going to pass on to my kid, but like, I'm fucking worried about it. So like, I don't know, like coming off of all medications, I guess it's not a viable strategy for a lot of people that have a necessity clinically, but then it kind of like reveals the underlying need for them to probably just fix all their natural stuff to even be in a position to potentially come off the medications to begin with. I I mean, I, I think, I think do the simple things first do your diet, you know, nutrient rich yeah. diet, toxin free diet as much as possible. That's why I'm a fan of organs, get organs, however you can, you know, optimize everything. But I think it's reasonable, especially for males, 90 days before you want to conceive, like yeah. think about your supplements, think about medications you're on. Definitely if it's metformin and let's just be clear here, like diabetes is very treatable. It's fixable without medications. Like we know that this is not controversial. Like if we could find a way to incept these people and say, Hey, you're going to wake up and be like, I want to make lifestyle changes. I'm going to get walking. I'm going to get in the sun. I'm going to change my diet. I'm going to stop eating junk food and get rid of Coca-Cola. If, if you believe what I believe, they get rid of seed oils. If you believe what I believe they could eat more red meat, more organs, more nutrient rich foods. We're going to fix diabetes. Like this is fixable. And we're giving people meds and not necessarily within mainstream Western medicine saying like, Hey, this is a fixable disease. Yeah. Um, do you want to take meds or do you want to do lifestyle? Somebody says, Hey, I want to take meds. Great. But that's one of the things I hope to be able to affect in my lifetime is the paradigm that we use. Now, I know this isn't going to be applicable for the majority of people, but like extreme outliers with genetic predispositions, like type one diabetes or familial hypercholesterolemia. And these individuals who are put on certain medications to manage things that their genetics have essentially or I don't know, some autoimmune thing that happened when they were like a fucking baby or like however this stuff manifests itself. Those kind of people are kind of like need to be on medications to prevent certain things from happening. So like when they're about to have a kid, is there like some sort of, I don't know, like what do they need to be mindful of? Do you think they just got to like bite the bullet and stay on their stuff? (laughs) Like, I know that's not, maybe not a question you should be, you need to answer, but I don't know. It's just like an interesting paradigm. Everyone is so individual, right? Like, yeah. I mean, a type one diabetic is not going to be on metformin. They're going to be on insulin. They are completely different things. They don't so, get like, like enhanced glucose control with metformin above and beyond. It's like it's, where they can lower their insulin dose though. It's pretty rare. I mean, I, I haven't, you know, yeah. worked with a lot of diabetics. Maybe they're incorporating it, but I, yeah. you know, in, type one diabetics, at least in the beginning are not insulin resistant. Mm-hmm. So they're, that's the mechanism of metformin. They're not getting inappropriate gluconeogenesis. They're not secreting any insulin because the pancreas is attacked by, here we are back to autoimmune disease. Mm-hmm. And I'll say this, which is quite interesting. There are case studies. These are small case studies of young kids doing dietary interventions, specifically a carnivore diet. There's a group in Hungary that's a pretty intense group and pretty strict, but They've published case reports of reversing type one diabetes in a nine-year-old kid. And I think a 10-year-old kid when they caught it early and they did this elimination diet. Granted, many people would see a carnivore diet as pretty intense, but it argues like, is there an autoimmune component to some cases of type one diabetes that could be affected positively by changing diet? This is why it's important to ask these questions. I would speculate probably like I like that's just my you know layman's perspective but like I would think things like you know Hashimoto's thyroiditis if you get in front of it before it's like totally destroyed like you can obviously retain function but if you just let it disintegrate itself through like autoimmune attack over years and years like eventually the organ can only withstand so much like damage to a point that it's like non-functional presumably so if you're a type 1 diet or going to be a type 1 diabetic like 
it's at least one of my friends who's a type one diabetic. It didn't happen. He didn't notice it until he was like in his teens. So like, presumably when you're a kid, like, actually, I don't know, maybe that's wrong. I would have to revisit the situation to actually ask him the context, but presumably this is like a progressive thing that's happening. Something internally is like, I don't know, attacking your pancreas, presumably, unless your immune system. Yeah. And then at some point you, you know, I don't know, destroy enough beta cells that you no longer have any function. But if you got in front of it, then maybe you could have prevented it to ha- happening in the first place. Seems reasonable, right? And then yeah. the question becomes, what is triggering the autoimmunity? That's why I got interested in carnivore, all right? And so the hypothesis, which many people would disagree with, but I think is fascinating, that I've kind of been captivated by for the past few years is, are some of these plant chemicals triggering autoimmunity in some people? Who knows? But we ask the question, 